we're getting set up here for our next speaker, one of my favorite people in the whole world, and one of the best horticulturists that I know. Um, miss, well, not Miss anymore. Um, Andrea DeLongamaya is the Director of Horticulture at the Wildflower Center, and I was lucky when I was there, I got to work with her. Um, she's doing a fabulous job with the gardens. If you haven't been out there recently, I highly recommend that you go visit and see her wonderful work, and the new uh, family garden is just fantastic. But Andrea is a fabulous horticulturist, and she is going to talk to us today about plant combinations and time sharing and um, native plants. So please welcome Andrea DeLongamaya. Okay, can you hear me all right? Is the mic okay? Maybe I need to talk over my left, right shoulder. Maybe a little higher. Is that, is that better? <laughs> okay, let's see if that works. Can you hear me all right? I have to apologize. I'm getting over laryngitis, so my voice is a little gravelly. I haven't smoked a pack of cigarettes already today. Um, all right. <clears throat> so um, I'm at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, and um, our mission now is all about promoting native plants. It's to conserve and restore and create healthy landscapes using native plants. We do a bunch of different things at the Wildflower Center. Uh, I'm involved with the horticulture program, obviously, but we do a lot of things, uh, everything from natural areas and trails. We do restoration on our property that where we, we're doing restoration mostly for research to figure out what the best management practices are to achieve certain results. Um, and that's part of our consulting program. We do have environmental education for adults, professionals, and children as well. And we also have a plant conservation program. We do seed banking uh, and um, monitoring of different vegetation areas to help guide us for our information into the future. We have national outreach programs. Um, largely, we do that with our uh, website. We have a very wonderful website. If you haven't been to wildflower.org, uh, there's a lot of resources that I think you would find very useful in your profession. Um, and then we also have an out, um, a quarterly newsletter, a magazine that we publish. Um, and then we also have a sustainable sites initiative, which maybe many of you have heard about. And our sustainable sites uh, initiative was a program that we jointly uh, created with the U.S. Botanic Garden and the American Society of Landscape Architects. And we just launched, uh, I'm sorry, we just completed our um, pilot phase, and it is now into the public phase. And essentially what it is, it's similar to LEAD for building. It's a set of voluntary guidelines that, uh, that you can follow on your landscape and then achieve certain uh, points and get a, a certification. Because um, you can have a wonderfully platinum LEAD, lands I mean, platinum LEAD building, but then your landscape might be just horrible. And, you know, St. Augustine is sucking up lots of water. It doesn't make any sense, and I've seen that. Um, so the landscapes, unlike buildings, can not just be less bad like buildings, but actually can do positive things for the landscape and the environment. So Lady Bird Johnson was our founding. She, along with her friend Helen Hayes, the actress, founded the Wildflower Center. Uh, and here's a quote that I really like from her. Um, she said a lot of wonderful things, but wherever I go in America, I like it when the land speaks its own language in its own regional accent. And I try to practice that in her lovely southern drawl, but I'm not going to subject you to that. So what is a native plant? Um, this is a commonly used phrase. We say native plant, native plant all the time. But what are we talking about? Um, and it's a very complicated issue. Here is my best summary of... Um, of, what, of how you can use that, how you can define that. It is a plant that occurs naturally where it evolved. Now it's very messy and complicated because evolution is happening on a daily basis, but um, you know, if, if you've had something that's been in a particular location for several thousand years, that's probably a pretty good indication. And there's also a geographic component of this. If you go to a nursery and you say you want to buy some native plants, well, what are you talking about? Are you talking about native to the United States? Um, the Wildflower Center, we consider the plants that are native to the state of Texas in our collections on site. But really, technically, um, something like a Mexican white oak, which is native to the state, is not really native here. It may do well, and it may be a good plant to use, but it's not necessarily native. So really, how, where you define native depends on 
what your goals are for your landscape. Are you trying to do a restoration? In that case, you want to be very strict about what, uh, what you're considering native and getting local genotypes. Or maybe you're just trying to find plants that are drought resistant. Or if you're trying to accommodate wildlife, that's going to give you a different um, range of, of plants to, or a different range geographically that you would pull from. So it's just important to consider that, uh, you know, native to Texas or, or Travis County would be basically the farther away you get from where your landscape is, generally speaking, the less likely it is that those plants are going to be well adapted. Um, sometimes it's helpful to, to determine what is native by deciding what isn't native. And here are some examples of things that you might have seen in our area that are not native. Uh, we have several species of uh, invasive species oops, um, that you might find on the green belt, for example. Uh, when I was taking native plants at UT many years ago, um, it was not always very clear what was native and what wasn't. Like Nandinas were all over the place, and I was identifying them, and I not, did not realize that they weren't native for a long time because our teacher wasn't very good about distinguishing that. Um, but these are things that you might see growing wild. does not mean that they're native. Similarly, plants, there are plants that are, native, that are not native but are adapted, that are well adapted. Here's some examples that are Mexican species that you might be familiar with. Um, the new gold lantana, uh, the pink skullcap, the uh, purple um, Mexican bush sage. These are all things that are not considered invasive in our area. They're drought resistant and they may do very well, but they're not native to Texas. So again, it's not that they're bad to use. You might want to use them, but they're not native to Texas. Um, here's another example of, you know, people, we're from the Wildflower Center, and so people assume sometimes that if you're planting a package of wildflower seeds that are all going to be native, but that's not necessarily the case. There are a lot of non-native uh, wildflower seed mixes that might contain Eurasian species, as in this case. So like the rocket larkspur and some of the cosmos and the cornflower, those are things that you might see in a wildflower center, I mean in a wildflower seed mix but aren't something that you would find growing wild around here naturally. So now that we have that out of the way, we all know what we're talking about. Um, one of the things that I wanted to really stress to people using native plants and landscapes is that um, the plants themselves do not dictate what kind of landscape style you have. Uh, you can have a very beautiful natural landscape, naturalistic style, which is what most people think about when they're using native plants. Um, here's some examples of some, I think, successful naturalistic looking gardens. Um, but a lot of times you'll have people say, well, I don't want native plants because they're messy or they, you know, they, they're in Camden. I just, you know, I don't want native plants. Um, I used to work at Barton Springs Nursery in a previous life. And um, it was interesting because I had a customer come in and he just, right from the beginning, like, I don't want native plants. Um, and so I just noted that and I showed him a bunch of stuff and I just didn't tell him they were native and it was all fine. <laughs> so. Um, there are these biases that, um, that people hold. You can make a beautiful naturalistic garden with native plants if that's what you want, uh, but you can also make more formal designs or stylized gardens using native plants. And it's in the design, how you arrange the space and the plants, how you arrange the plants and the hardscape. Um, and it's also a lot of it is in the maintenance. And as a horticulturist, I can't stress enough how much design is carried through in the maintenance. You can have everything drawn out on a piece of paper exactly how you have in mind and you have a vision, but if the maintenance people don't understand your vision, then your design is not going to continue in the way you intended it to. Um, so shifting into plants for special situations, I'll just give you a sampling of some different plants that you might consider in your landscapes. Um, some of them you probably are familiar with, maybe some of them you aren't. One of the ones uh, that um, has gotten a lot of attention is a turf grass mix that we call Habiturf. And this is a, a blend of species that the Wildflower Center has developed over the last many years. And instead of relying on a monoculture for turf, which is traditionally what people use, we are using a blend of three or more native species of turf grasses. Um, buffalo grass, blue grama, and curly mesquite are the ones that we've selected because they stay short naturally. And they also have a very fine leaf blade so that they blend together and they don't look like you have three different things happening at the same time, so it looks fairly uniform. And one of the advantages that you get, you know, a long time ago, everybody's saying, you know, plant buffalo grass, that's the native turf grass that you should be planting. And if you've done that, we have enough experience over the last several decades to know that buffalo grass by itself can be a challenge in many situations. It tends to get weedy pretty easily. 
Um, it's best if you don't mow it or if you ver mow it very high on an infrequent uh, basis, but still, the weeds are probably the biggest problem. And the reason for that is that buffalo grass um, naturally has, um, grows kind of with a loose, a loose matrix. It's designed to support wildflowers. It's, um, you know, you have holes in the, sp in the turf grass and then you have your blue bonnets or your Engelman daisies or whatever that grow in between them. So it's designed to have holes in it. It's not designed to be super tight. So um, if you can put some other grasses, other species in there, they'll fill in those holes and make it a denser, uh, denser turf. The other thing is having multiple species gives you some resilience in different um, soil conditions or different um, rainfall patterns or climate. So maybe one year you get a lot of rain and it might favor one species, the next year maybe it's less and something else is gonna take over a little bit more. So you have that resilience and dynamism in your landscape. <clears throat> Um, here are some charts that came off of our website um, that demonstrate how native grasses are better with keeping out weeds and other grasses. Um, so the, uh, the yellow boxes are weeds and then the green boxes, I'm talking about the top one, uh, the green boxes are your native grasses. So you have Bermuda grass on the left, then buffalo, then buffalo plus blue grama, and then the native mix would be uh, the habiturf. And so you can see how over um, more species you have, the more Result, or the more suppressed the weeds are. And then the bottom picture shows you a native, uh, how a mixture of native grasses ha can have a lot of leaf density, perhaps more than Bermuda grass, which is kind of hard to believe. But, um, but here you can see how you can have denser coverage. Now, turf grass, the habit turf, um, is fairly okay with some turf, I mean, with some um, foot traffic. But if you have a really heavy foot traffic, just like just about any turf grass, you're going to have. Um, ruts that develop and you know you might want to put in a pathway if you're going to have uh, an area that's continuously walked on. So it's not really good for heavy foot traffic and it's also not ideal for shade. It'll take light shade, um, medium shade, but if you have a real shady spot you might consider some of the native sedges or um, the straggler daisy, the horse herb is another alternative for a shady spot that would be really nice and stay low and look nice and even. A few trees, we've talked about trees a lot today, so um, here are just a couple examples. Uh, the cedar elm is the photograph on the left that has the sort of yellowy foliage. This is a f picture taken uh, from a tree in fall, uh, early fall, before the trees have lost their leaves, but they're starting to show a little bit of color. And this is a great tree, you're probably familiar with it, it's very common around here. I like to promote it as a good shade tree. It's uh, relatively disease resistant, it's drought resistant, it grows in the blackland soils, it also grows in the hill country area in their thin thinner, rockier soils. Um, it's just a good, tough tree, and they have this beautiful, stately uh, structure to them, which I, I think is really um, beautiful in the landscape. And then the other two are a couple species of understory trees, or smaller trees, not necessarily understory. The mountain laurel that has the purple flowers, you can smell them outside right now. Um, that's a great one. It's, uh, it can be an understory under some shade or it can be out in full sun. Uh, it's helpful, it's useful in the landscape because it's evergreen and it's also deer resistant, which a lot of people um, really struggle with deer and if you're looking for something that will tolerate that, the mountain laurel is a good one. Um, the whole plant though, however, is toxic, so be careful if you have stupid dogs that like to eat on everything, um, beware and maybe pick something else. Um, also the seeds, the beans, the bean pods are kind of a brownish, dark brown woody, and then if you split them open, you'll see the bright red fruit, the seeds inside. And those uh, are also very toxic, and since they're bright red, sometimes they seem to be appealing for children, so um, that's another thing to be aware of. A lot of times it's the toxic part of the plant that makes it deer resistant. I forgot to set my timer here. There's a timer here, this is cool. <laughs> Are we, what, into like 10 minutes? Okay. Um, the uh, picture on the upper right is the Anacacho orchid tree, which is another one of my favorite ornamental trees for our area. Uh, it really is native further south and southwest, um, but does very well here, especially in a dry garden. If you're trying to do a landscape that doesn't get extra irrigation, um, once it gets established, you can let this tree go on its own. I've actually found that under irrigation, they don't live very long. I've had this experience with redbuds, and I'd like to see if anybody in the group shares this, 
the, here's my theory. I don't know if this is true. Maybe it makes sense. That um, with the orchid trees and perhaps the red buds, that they grow really fast under irrigation, maybe faster than they normally would in the natural areas that are not irrigated, uh, which creates weak wood. And I've just seen a lot of times where branches will just split off of the main tree and to the point where the whole thing just kind of falls apart and you have to start over. Um, so I would highly recommend planting orchid trees in a very dry condition, um, get it established, but then kind of really back off and leave it alone. Um, but they're lovely when they bloom in the spring. They just get covered with white flowers. Um, and then sporadically throughout the summer, they'll bloom here and there. And then maybe again, another nice show in the fall. But this big spring show is what you, what you get it from it. Uh, but the tree has a lovely shape to it. It's a nice, small, multi-trunk tree with a really silvery gray bark. Um, and it really complements other plants in your landscape nicely. A few hedges you can, talk, uh, you can use in your landscape, the Ceniso, uh, which is also called Texas Sage. I don't like calling it Texas Sage because there's Salvia Texana, which I call Texas Sage. Um, I like to call the Ceniso also because the Spanish name Ceniso means ash, which I think is a very descriptive term to call this plant because it's nice ash color. If it never bloomed, I would be thrilled because the foliage is so beautiful, but then you get these benefits of these purple flowers, um, which will bloom on and off throughout the summer. Uh, it's been called barometer bush, partly because um, the, they're time to bloom around when we get some rains. They're also very malleable shrubs. You can trim them, trim them to be super tight or fairly loose. Um, I've seen somebody bonsai them. Um, it can be, uh, you can do a lot of things with it, depending on the style of your landscape and what you're trying to achieve. Um, maintenance, a lot of times, if it doesn't get maintained properly over time or if it's in too much shade, they'll tend to get long and leggy. If it's in too much shade, you just need to pick a better, a better suited plant. Um, but if your tree is long and leggy for other reasons, um, you can rehabilitate them by cutting it down pretty much to the ground, just to nubs, and then letting it re-sprout, and then you can shape that. It may seem very drastic, but really it works. If, you're tr if your shrub is healthy to begin with, you can, you can do that, and they come back really quickly. The uh, picture on the lower right um, is an example of the dwarf yopon holly that's been kept very tight. Um, so here again, you can, you can use these plants and clip them and make them look very formal if you'd like, or don't, and then they just look a little softer and a little uh, more natural looking. Um, what's nice about the yopon, the dwarf yopon, if you're trying to use them as a shrub, I mean as a hedge, they're a good substitute for boxwoods. They have a small leaf uh, that looks very similar to a boxwood, so I like to substitute them instead. And they're slower growing. They're more drought resistant. They're slower growing. You don't have to trim them as often. The downfall is it takes them longer to get to mature size, but once they've reached that size, you're not out there every week uh, clipping your hedges, which saves a lot of time and energy. Uh, a couple of vines I'll mention. This is um, the Virginia creeper, which is a really nice plant if you're just looking for a soft green, kind of a romantic look. Um, you can have them growing over uh, trellises, and they kind of drift, uh, drip off of the trellis. Um, if you have them in sun, you can see the nice uh, red fall color that they can get. More shade, they're going to have less red, but they're very shade tolerant. So if you're looking for plants that will do well in a shady situation, that's definitely an option. And then the Carolina jasmine is a nice one. They're blooming right now. This is their time of year. Heavy blooming in the spring. Um, and they get very big. Um, so you know, make sure you have a, very, a fairly substantial trellis to put it on so it doesn't just overwhelm the trellis. Um, and then the flowers on the lower right picture, um, I'm kind of teasing you here. They don't have red berries. <laughs> this is a plant, a picture that was taken with it growing on a yopon holly. So those are yopon berries in the background. But just to see the picture of the flower up close is kind of nice. They're, they're very pretty flowers. Really good for attracting various um, pollinators mostly bees and butterflies. And they're evergreen, which is nice too. Um, another plant that's an evergreen vine from East Texas, similar to the Carolina jasmine, is the cross vine, which looks very much like our local um, trumpet creeper. Cross vine does really well for us in our landscapes. Um, and I like using it more than I do the trumpet creeper because it doesn't send runners like the trumpet vine. Um, also, um, it seems to be a more reliable bloomer the trumpet creeper seems like it blooms sometimes, and then it doesn't sometimes, and you're not really sure why. Um, but the cross vine is very reliable. 
heavy, heavy blooming in the spring and then sporadically through the summer and maybe you'll get another smaller bur burst in the fall. Uh, really good for attracting hummingbirds also. Um, here's some plants that are going to be good for an herbaceous border. Um, these are your showier perennials and annuals. Oops. Wow. Okay. Um, some of the plants in this, these pictures, you have the, um, the wine cup, which has the purple flowers on the photo that's in the upper left. Um, and that's kind of a nice low-growing-ish plant, um, so it's a nice filler between taller things. Heavy blooming in the spring, super beautiful. Um, and then in between them, there's the Zexmania, which hasn't quite kicked into flower in this picture yet. But that's another very tough, um, drought-resistant plant with yellow, gold, <coughs> yellow goldish flowers. Um, the Zexmania is also a, has a benefit of the seeds are very rich in, um, in oils. It's in the sunflower family, like most other plants in the sunflower, sunflower family are really good for attracting your seed eating birds, like your finches. American goldfinches go crazy over this. Uh, and then the photograph with the bird bath, um, there's some mealy blue sage in that photo, there's some purple coneflower, the uh, broadleaf grayish plant in the back is the detura, the jimson weed, which uh, I love growing in a garden, but also it, beware that it's toxic. Um, and has been used as a hallucinogen, so um, if you have teenagers, forget about the dumb dogs now, we're talking about your dumb teenagers, um, you know, make sure that Either they don't know about it, or they don't have access to it, or they're good. <laughs> uh, another concept that I wanted to share with you as designers, because one of the things that I think is more challenging if you're using a lot of native plants on your landscape, is you don't have the luxury of going out and buying bedding plants to fill in holes. Um, that's a nice, easy fix that can be very quick to, to deal with. Um, <clears throat> but if you design with uh, this idea of time sharing in mind, you can maximize the space and have maximum flowers at different times of the year without having to replant them every season. So that saves you in costs of the plants and materials is also a savings with labor. Um, so here there's the Turk's cap on the left, upper left part of the slide. The Turk's cap blooms through the summer. It's actively growing in the warm season. Come winter, it freezes to the ground. You cut it back. And if you didn't have anything else happening, you'd just have bare mulch underneath there, and you'd be looking at mulch all winter, kind of boring. Uh, if you plant it with the giant spiderwort, which is the lower left photograph, um, you have a foliage that looks a lot like a daylily, kind of a long, strappy foliage. Um, and that will grow all winter, and then sends up flower bolts in the spring. They're starting to bloom right now this time of year. And uh, <clears throat> then originally, you know, around the end of spring, like sometime early May, late April, the plants dry up and completely go dormant. So you can cut them back, or if you don't do anything, they just kind of disappear on their own. And that's about the time that the Turks cap are starting to come out. So you can have those things happening. You're planting the plants in the same location in your garden, but they're doing things at different times of the year. So a similar combination is using the Texas lantana, which is actively growing in the warm season, and then combining that with something like, you could use blue bonnets, uh, or Texas Star, which are annuals. Uh, let them reseed, and then they'll come back every year. This example has Pink Evening Primrose, because um, that's a very vigorous plant, too. And um, both of those plants together, you know, they can duke it out and hold their own. So um, there is a warning, though, with the Pink Evening Primrose. That's something that you want to be cautious about using in a garden, because they spread a lot, and they can overcome other uh, less robust plants. But in the right place, they're wonderful. Here's an example of what that actually looks like in, in reality, in an actual garden setting. So the picture in the upper left shows you what a springtime garden would look like. And the uh, pink in that photograph is the pink evening primrose. The red is the Indian paintbrush. Uh, there's some yellow ranunculus, our native ranunculus. Um, I think there's some maybe some verbena and uh, a few other things in there. Same exact plantings in the springtime, and then the same exact plantings in the fall looks completely different. The fall you have um, actively growing and showing are the, um, the Gulf mealies. We also have the short prairie goldenrod, which are doing most of the color. And then there's also little prairie, uh, prairie fleabane, which is springs, blooms both spring and fall. So you get um, lots of bang out of that plant. But all of those things that were there in the spring are either seeds on the ground or they're dormant perennials. Um, so you can maximize the show 
uh, by combining those different plants. A few plants that are good for sunny and xeric gardens. <clears throat> um, we have the, uh, in the left side picture, is kind of a combination that's modeled after stuff that you'd find in the Chisos Mountains in the Big Bend region. So you have the, um, the big tooth maple combined with the Havard agave and the Mexican feathergrass. And it's fun to use Mexican feathergrass in gardens because people don't realize where they're native to. And they, you find them growing wild in beautiful stands um, in West Texas up in the mountain areas. Um, and you see them growing with the Havard agave and you can't design a more perfect uh, plant combination. Just the stiff growth of the agave and the blue color combined with the green and the um, soft flowiness of the grass is just really amazingly beautiful. And then you throw in some boulders in there and you just have this beautiful landscape. Um, the photo on the right <coughs> has the square bud primrose, which is the larger plant with the yellow flowers. Um, in front of that is a damianita, which is another low-growing, moundy plant that's very deer-resistant, deer evergreen, uh, it smells kind of nice, which is fun. Um, there's the twist leaf yucca. Actually, I think that's the pale leaf yucca. Um, there's some blue bonnets in there also, and the prairie be beard's tongue, the penstemon cobea. So these are all things that do well um, in dry, perhaps rocky um, situations. A lot of these things, if you drive through the hill country, this is a spring photograph. So in the spring, if you drive through the hill country, these are things you'd find growing out of... Uh, caliche or very thin soils without irrigation. So using that as a model and what you can use in your landscape, um, here's some plants that will do well. So the idea is, you know, you can get things established, irrigate them until they get going, and then perhaps just walk away. And the maintenance then just becomes weeding and editing and less about watering. You might need to do a little bit of watering if we have a really dry spell. A couple other plants that would be good in a dry situation. The spineless prickly pear is another one of my favorites because it's just so easy. Um, it has this beautiful sculptural form. And again, the, the texture and form of the plant looks so good with just about anything else you can plant next to it. It looks good with gray foliage, dark green, soft, wispy grasses. It looks great with other succulents. Um, this is another one that you don't have to water once it gets going. Or actually, you don't even have to water it to get going. Just throw the pad on the ground and you have a plant. Uh, in front of it is a lesser used plant that, um, at least in our area, the Austin area, that's the desert marigold, um, and that's Balea multiradiata. Uh, I say that because you might not be as familiar with that one. And this is an annual that you see also in West Texas, uh, very drought resistant. It has a really gray, silvery um, uh, leaf to it. The whole stems and leaves are all very silvery and gray, which helps them retain moisture and reflect the uh, the UV radiation coming from the sun, so that's how it protects itself. And But it's stunningly beautiful. The beautiful flowers, bright, bright lemon yellow, um, bloom heavily in the spring and early summer. Um, you might have some going off into the fall as well, but it's mostly a spring and summer plant. But it's an annual, so let it reseed and then it'll come back for you. If you have shade, here's some examples of some things that you can use in a shady woodland type garden. Um, the Turk's cap and, uh, and the picture on the upper right is Turk's cap combined with um, one of our native blue mist flowers. Um, this one's a little less common. Usually you see the Greg's mist flower used in our area, which is great. This is the blue mist um, that is more suited for shade. It doesn't have as long a bloom period, though, so it's really just a fall bloomer. Um, but using that and uh, with the Turk's cap gives you a nice woodland feel. Um, the Turk's cap is great for attracting pollinators, specifically hummingbirds and some of your larger butterflies throughout the summer. And then the photo on the lower left is a nice, beautiful stand of golden groundsel. Uh, and this one is becoming more available commercially, fortunately, because it's really a wonderful woodland plant. Um, it just makes a nice ground cover. It looks beautiful throughout the winter. It looks like a really dark head of butter lettuce, the butter crunch lettuce kind of what it looks like, a little bit thicker leaf row. Um, and then they bloom really early in the spring. They're one of the first things to start blooming. Um, and so you're like, okay, yes, spring is coming. And you can get excited about that. And it's also really important to have these early blooming plants um, that can support some of the early pollinators that are coming through and looking for nectar sources. That's the golden ground cell. Ground cell, G-R-O-U-N-D-S-E-L. Um, and that's one that'll seed itself out, but also 
as you can kind of see from the picture, it sort of colonizes slowly. It just sort of, you know, uh, pups out and, and makes a nice carpet. And you can transplant them very easily and move them around. Um, and then they kind of finish doing their thing, and then you better have something else to take over its place because it'll be kind of a hole in the landscape for a while. If you have pretty dry conditions in a shady situation, here are some plants that you can consider. The uh, upper left is a picture of the, um, the cedar sage, which is aptly named. It grows under cedar trees uh, where the cedar is very dense, the juniper is very dense, and you don't get a lot of rain coming through the canopy unless we get a really dense rain uh, that'll saturate the soils. Also dense shade. Um, so the cedar sage is really useful for really dense shade and drought conditions. Um, and their time to bloom, they're starting, they're, I've seen a couple starting to bloom right now. It's a little bit early, but their time to bloom with the first migrations of the hummingbirds coming through in our area. So that's a nice benefit too. The whole plant stays kind of short. When they're blooming, is, um, the flower stalks might get a foot tall, but typically the foliage stays kind of low to the ground and makes a nice ground cover, which is evergreen throughout the winter time. Um, and it's also fairly deer resistant, which is good. The uh, picture on the lower left is um, a Nolina texana. It's also called um, bear grass or basket grass. And this is another plant that up until fairly recently was hard to find in, in the trade, but it's becoming more common. And I'm so glad because this is another super duper easy plant to grow. Um, and it's, it's a gorgeous plant. It's, um, it's called bear grass, but it's actually a, a woody lily. Um, so it's evergreen throughout the year. Uh, it doesn't really change the way it looks except when it blooms in the spring. It's starting to put out flower buds now. And the flowers are these pyramids of white, kind of pinkish white flowers that bloom in the foliage. Um, and then the grass, the, the leaves just kind of have this beautiful draping, cascading texture to it. Nice fine texture and then drooping, drooping form. It looks fabulous like going over a limestone wall or um, you know, around rocks. It's a nice contrast. And it really evokes motion even though nothing's moving. It just looks fluid like water. Um, very drought resistant too. Um, they're, you can find them. The only drawback I would say is they're kind of slow growing, but you know, get them in the ground and they'll, they'll do their thing in a couple of years. They'll be pretty mature size. Um, on the right, you have a picture of the twist leaf yuccas. And that is another good plant for dry shade. People think of using yuccas in a, in a xeric kind of garden, maybe a dry rock garden. And there are certainly, most yuccas are good for those kind of conditions. But the twist leaf yucca is a good one that's adapted for shady conditions here. And the inset there, you can see how uh, the leaves are twisting, hence the name twist leaf yucca. If you have deer, um, most of the time deer won't eat the plants, but they definitely like to eat the flower stalks. So don't expect to see the white flowers in the spring if you have deer problems. <clears throat> Come on, there we go. A few plants that you can use for water gardens. If you have ponds, um, there are a number of different native species that do well. Not all native plants are drought resistant, right? <laughs> Just because they're native doesn't mean that you uh, can't give them lots of water and have them do well. We have several native irises. Uh, I would highly recommend not using the, the yellow flag iris, which is an invasive species that is commonly sold in garden centers that sell water plants. Um, but we have the blue flag iris is a really nice one. Um, and then we also have other things like pickerel weed, uh, which you can find um, in the stock tank pic on the uh, picture on the right. The stock tank has the star sedge, um, which is a really another nice water plant. There's also horsetail, which uh, you're probably familiar with horsetail. They actually don't need to be in water. They can grow in soil um, as long as it's not too dry. Um, if it's too dry, they just kind of get thin and, and they look scorched and they don't look as pretty. Um, but this is one of the, the horsetail is one of the best plants I've ever seen for dragonfly perches. So if you're trying to create a wildlife habitat, that's a fun one to include. We have native water lilies. This is the white water lily, um, which I think is just as beautiful as any um, tropical water lily you'd want to grow. Um, and does the same thing pretty much. You don't have to protect it in the winter. It's cold hardy here. Um, and then above that and to the right is an image of um, a plant called lizard tail, uh, which you can see why. They have the flower stalks, those white flower stalks kind of look like a tail. 
Uh, and this is also a very shade tolerant plant. It'll grow in full sun as well. Um, it's related to the Oja Santa, if you've grown that, the root beer plant. And the foliage kind of smells like that, uh, like the Oja Santa, which is kind of fun. What was that? Lizard tail. Yes. And I think, um, I think Denise confirmed, but I think we can put the plant list. I have a plant list that we can put on the website after the presentation so you can get all the names of everything. Um, we've talked about rain gardens a little bit uh, with the Grow Green program. Um, there's a wonderful fact sheet that was put out a couple years ago about rain gardens. And we have a lot of native plants that are perfectly adapted to this kind of situation. Because we have flash floods and we have drought, you tend to have these areas um, perhaps on a first order of the stream where you don't get a lot of scouring floods, but you get a little bit of flooding and then it dries out and you don't have the continuous uh, moisture that you would have on a perennial stream. So the plants that can take drought conditions when it's not raining and be inundated for a day or two if it is raining, um, some of the plants that you might consider would be the bald cypress. Um, some of the other trees in here, we have possum haw hollies, um, there's button bush, uh, rough leaf dogwood. Those are all things that you would find in a riparian area on the edges where it might be dry for long periods of time, but also can take moisture. A lot of grasses are really good for this, switchgrass, bushy bluestem, uh, gamma grass. Those are all really good grasses that you could put, uh, especially if you're trying to do erosion control, but also just aesthetically, they're beautiful plants. Um, and then some of the perennials that we have in there, things like Turks Cap do pretty well under those conditions. Uh, the obedient plants do well. Um, although be careful because some of the obedient plants that are available commercially are not native. They all are fairly aggressive, so that's another thing to be mindful of. And then the picture on the bottom right I just throw in because um, I just think that the grasses are so beautiful and to be able to see what they look like throughout the winter time, if you don't, if you're not super tidy and you don't cut everything back after the first freeze, leave them standing and it looks pretty nice and gives you something to look at through the winter time. Uh, I mentioned bushy blue stem, that's the picture on the upper left. Um, this is what it looks like in the summer when it first starts to bloom. And then as it gets cooler into the fall, it turns this beautiful rust color. Um, very soft, fluffy plumes. They're very pretty plants. And then the art picture is one of our native hibiscuses. Uh, this is the halbert leaf hibiscus, um, which get to be pretty good-sized shrubs. Um, they, I would say they get six, seven feet tall, perhaps. Um, and you can treat them like a perennial and cut them to the ground if you'd like, or leave the stem standing for next year, and they'll just be that much bigger earlier. But they're nice. They bloom all through the summer um, with these beautiful white flowers with the red centers. I love talking about native edibles because the whole foodie movement has gotten so much momentum and people want to do a lot of home gardening, uh, which is great. It's so exciting to see people getting into that and feeding themselves. It's very empowering. It's a great way to get kids to eat vegetables. Um, but we often overlook the native plants that are also good for, uh, for human uses. Um, and a lot of these are perennials, which is great too. You don't have to replant them every year. So for example, one of my favorites that um, I use the most is the chili piquin, which is a, the native chili pepper. It's actually the precursor for most of the peppers that we're familiar with. It's capsicum annuum, annuum which is the same species as bell peppers and serranos and jalapenos. Those are all the same species that came from our original native chili piquin. Uh, but our, they're perennial for us here, and they grow in shade or full sun. Um, they're ornamental. They're very pretty plants. Um, they're super spicy, and I like to crush them up, put them in scrambled eggs or a pot of beans or spaghetti sauce or anytime you want some heat. Um, and the mockingbirds really like them too. So the chili piquin is a great example. Um, the prickly pear are in here because you can eat the tender new growth in the spring. If you've had nopales or nopalitos in your breakfast tacos, um, you can grow your own. Um, they're also multi-use because they, the fruit, the bright red fruit, when they're ripe, are really sweet. You have to scrape the, the, thorn, the um, prickles off of them, but you can make margarita, mar uh, I'm sorry, uh, margaritas out of the tunas. The tuna is what you call the fruit, or prickly pear jelly is really delicious. Um, there's a plant in the back, the uh, Barbados cherries, which are um, commonly used more just as a landscape shrub. But the fruit are edible, and they are high in vitamin C. They're related to the plant that gives us acerola. Um, so there are a lot of plants that are native um, 
that you can use uh, as part of an edible landscape. You might just incorporate them in as, as ornamental plants, but then just be mindful to go out and harvest every now and then. <clears throat> I hadn't realized this, but the pink evening primrose a few years ago, um, somebody mentioned to me that the pink evening primrose was edible, the foliage, the new growth in the spring, and I've tried it and I really am hooked. I put it on my salads. Uh, I don't, you don't cook it like a potter, but eat it fresh. It has kind of a uh, arugula kind of flavor to it, which is nice. And if you have pinking primrose, you have plenty to harvest, probably. Um, use native plants in containers. This is another way to um, expand what you're doing. If you have a patio garden, a lot of people have uh, apartment living situations. They can't have a full garden in the ground. Um, so using things in containers can be a nice way to incorporate them. Um, plants in containers also tend to dry out quickly, so using some of our really drought-resistant native plants could be one way to to manage that by using the agaves or um, coral, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the coral yucca is another really great plant for a container. You can also use containers to highlight plants that if you put in the ground might be overwhelmed by more robust plants. That's another technique that I've used. Um, like if you have a small cactus or something and you plant it in the ground, it might get covered up by a blackfoot daisy or something. Uh, and you can just put them up at eye level and highlight them just to, to feature the, the beauty of the plants themselves. Here's some examples of some beds that we did at the Wildflower Center that are essentially container gardens using stock tanks. We drilled holes in the bottom for drainage uh, and planted them up. It looks pretty nice. What's nice about them, too, is they're elevated, so ergonomically you're not stooping over to, um, to do your weeding and maintenance. Um, you can see that they also can be used as a water garden. Um, I think that is a liatris. Yeah, the gay feather. And I probably wouldn't put a liatris in a pot because they're so drought resistant. If you did it by itself and didn't water it, that would be fine. But um, planting the liatris with the wine cups and those other plants are probably going to take a little bit more water. And what the liatris does is they just kind of get sprawly looking. They don't stay nice and tight. But if you keep them good and dry, then they tend to be more upright. So you could put them in their own pot and let them be dry. And just know, though, that they're only going to be doing their thing in uh, late summer. Um, native bonsai, we had a couple times where we've had the local bonsai exhibit, uh, local bonsai societies come and do an exhibit for, with us. And it was fun to see the wide range of things that they had. Um, and I, visitors were always amazed, like, wow, you can torture native plants too. <laughs> and the bonsai society folks, they were just growing these, not because they were native plants, just because they were good um, for bonsai. And then we have our spring sale. This is our, my advertisement. Um, we have our spring plant sale coming up. So we have about 300 different species of native plants that are going to be available. We'll have more information on our website, including a plant list. And to wrap it up, I like this quote. Um, this is how we make our gardens here. These are the plants that tell us we're home. To me, using native plants, a lot of the reasons people do them is because they're drought resistant, they're insect resistant, disease resistant, all those great benefits, but also they just make it look like our area. It looks, it looks like Texas. And there's our website. And I think I'm out of time. Do we do questions? One or two questions, if anybody has any. Or I'll, I can linger for a little while, if you're shy. <laughs> OK, and then we go.